Right. Okay. There you go. Um, so yes. Yeah, so we uh, um, and our uh, agile book club. We we read uh, Team Mastery from from Jeff Watts, and we've invited Jeff along today to <laughs> discuss discuss with us um, uh, the book. Hi, Jeff. How are you doing? You uh, you mute. on mute though. On mute. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> oh, there we go. There we go. It wouldn't be an online meeting if we didn't do that, right? No, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. How are you? Yep, we're all good. A little bit cold today. <laughs> yeah, I got my fire on, so it's uh, it's nice and warm in here now. Um. So so yeah. So thanks thanks for coming along uh, and, and and taking time out uh, to discuss the the book with us. Um, I, I think, as we said in 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 our sort of uh, Sort of emails to set, set up this really the idea of, of today was you know to people who read the book and also we, we've uh, sort of viewed one of your YouTube uh, videos which actually is is uh, about team mastery in the in the remote sense so oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, quite, yeah. quite a few people have, have, have watched that as well so um, it, it was it was Ez that brought brought the club uh, brought the club uh, your your book. So uh, Ez, Ez, maybe if if you'd like to um, start off. Yeah, Jeff, I won't ask for any royalties, but yeah, I was the one <laughs> who, brought, who brought this one up. Um, I actually started reading this book before I joined Smart. So I've been here for three months, um, and I yeah I commented on LinkedIn actually at the speedy delivery. So yeah, good service, man. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I, it really resonated with me. A lot of it did resonate with me. And I, I, I read your Scrum Master book as well, mm -hmm. like in the day. And what I really liked about it was the fact that, you know, you 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 state what you think good looks like, and 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 that's okay. Good is good, mm -hmm. but then you also make the point that actually there can be a step higher than that. You can you can go great as well. Yeah. Um, but that's fine if you just stay at good. And I like the fact you translated that um, that idea into teams, and a, a lot of the the themes in this book actually resonated with me, which is why I brought it forward to the the, the other guys and said, maybe we should have a look through this because um, you know we've got a lot of work to do um, at Smart, and lots of good stuff's already happening, but we can definitely use the themes in this book to help uh, improve our teams. Cool. Was there anything in particular that made you made you go for the book in the first place? Um. Uh, well, I, I quite like the idea. I know, I know you weren't going for this, but I quite like the idea of having a one place where I can look at some good examples of what good looks like. Okay. And I know, I know the messaging in this book is not, hey, you know, if you follow all of this stuff in Squad, you're going to mm -hmm. have the perfect team. And if none of it's, if, if for example, you don't have a bit of it, then your team's not going to be great. That's, that's not what you were going for. But I quite like the idea of having a book that I can go back to time and time again and look at sort of areas where I can help my teams. Um, yeah, and, and you, you, you do have a lot of good stuff in there. Yeah, and the, the idea being that you can, if you're struggling to know where to start, then it could give you a few prompts and you know, people read through it and they, they can't help but look through their own lens, right? And they'll, like you say, it resonated with you. I'm sure every other person that read it, a different part would resonate with them because their team's in a different place and their, their challenges are slightly different. And it's... <clears throat> It's kind of almost my, my philosophy of writing a book is write a bad book quickly uh, and then find out where it's bad rather than try and write the perfect book. So it iterated a number of different times. But it's the same with a model, I think, is write something, uh, bad idea, prioritize your backlog badly, whatever it is, and then get feedback on where it is bad rather than try and get it perfect straight away. So you've got something that you can go to. But equally, I really wanted to make the point that it's not the way of doing it. It's not an exhaustive list or a complete list i'm glad no, you no, yeah no definitely um i was going to say there were a few kind of you know in relation to it resonating a few kind of head in hands moments where i'm like oh man i wish i'd read this book like two or three years ago and then i would have been able to handle this particular situation way better so yeah, i had a few sort of cringe good party stories to tell would you <laughs> yeah that's true but i wouldn't have had uh, as much cringing going on either when, like, when i look back uh, um, do we want to go into questions then, David? Uh, well, just uh, really, just sort of like a, a natural flow of sort of dis discussion, really. I mean, uh, what, what I'd maybe like to know, Jeff, is like, how did you come to the, uh, you know, the way that you've, uh, you know, the way that you wrote the book and the, and the way of using 
uh, scenarios like you did quite a lot. Why, why did you sort of decide on, on, on that path? Um, it's mainly, it's, it's my own biases, really. So <clears throat> when I when I learn I, I, over the years, I found that I, I really, I, t- I tend to resonate with people who can tell stories because I put myself in those positions a little bit like Ezra was saying there. Um, it's, it kind of normalizes it for people, realizing that they're not the only ones experiencing that kind of thing. Uh, and I find it a little bit easier to to get messages across in that way, I suppose, than than um, just writing very theoretically. I was never really one for the theoretical textbooks at school. I was more for like case studies and things. So that's, that's partly where it came from, I think. Um, and, and the good to great thing was I'm not really a big fan of anti-patterns. I mean, they're useful because I'd rather learn from somebody else's mistakes than mine, sure. But telling you all the ways that things go wrong doesn't necessarily lead to how you can do things right. It might do if you eliminated all the bad stuff and avoided all the traps, maybe. But it's not necessarily the elimination of the negative that leads to positive. So uh, I find it's easier to pick holes in things than it is to give, you know, good things to focus on. And I think we all need a lot more good stuff in general. <laughs> and it, and yeah, it also makes people uh, be, be a bit more receptive. I often think if you're telling them a good story as, as opposed to saying this is why you shouldn't do something or the, the, this that anti-pattern in terms of it being a little bit softer for them and a bit more, a little less resistant. Um, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. We, yeah. we actually incorporated that. We're, we're writing a load of training material at the moment and we realised that we'd fall in, into this whole of just like bunging down loads of anti-patterns rather than actually speaking to people from a more positive place and saying, this is something you could do rather than don't do this. Uh, so we really we really took that on board, actually. That was a really helpful piece for us. Um, oh, we're now just translating all of our anti-patterns into what does that actually mean you do do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah and don't, don't throw them away because they're, they're fun, right? They're, they're good stories, they're fun. And, it, and it's nice to have a few things and think, right, oh, yeah, I won't do that, I won't do that, I won't do that. Um, but one of the things that I, I can't even remember when it was, but it was such a long time ago, but it sort of stuck in my mind. I, I don't even know whether it's true. I'm not a neuroscientist, but I was told that the brain doesn't uh, think in terms of modality. So if, if you if you think to yourself, don't do this, don't do this, you know, don't mess up, don't mess up. All your brain is thinking is mess up. Um, that's what I, again, I can't verify it, but it's stuck in my head for so long. I thought, well, well rather than if I'm going to repeat something, let's have something a little bit more positive. <clears throat> so Nicole, yeah, sorry, I was going to say. Oh, well, um, before we maybe get into the detail of the book, to stick on what Ez was saying about your experience of writing it, and then your mm. experience of sharing it with people, I think we were talking about what are the bits that have most confounded people um where they just you know they've got stuck on it and they ask you questions about it over and over again if if any and then contra like vice versa what are the bits that people just can't get enough of have, have you seen patterns like that in speaking to people yeah i've I probably got more if I, if I thought about it more but the one thing that really pops into my head is people reading it and thinking okay it makes sense jeff but how do i get my team to do it yeah um, <laughs> People in the team reading it think, yeah, it makes sense, Jeff, but how do I get my managers to let us do it? Okay. Um, so it's all, it's the sort of the external focus. You know, this was, uh, 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 to come back to Ezra's point, this, this, yeah, there are, there are books written about teamwork, but there aren't necessarily that many written for the teams themselves. It's usually for a leader to do to a team or to create a team. And the idea here is, yeah, you could you could pick this up as a scrum master, a product owner, a coach, a manager, whatever. But equally, you could pick it up as a member of a team that didn't have any kind of leadership and wanted to create that sense of self leadership. And you could you could do that. That was kind of one one of the things that I wanted to get out of this. But it's easy. Yeah, it's a common human trait of yeah, this this would all work if so and so did something or so and so changed. Um, and you know, another of my sort of operating principles is that the only person you have a hope of changing is you. Um, 
So focus on yourself rather than focusing on trying to get anybody else to do anything differently and try and work out, well, why wouldn't they naturally do something different, better, more helpful? Um, and how can I affect that <clears throat> rather than I need to make this person do something different? That's that's the number one common thread, I would say. It's not necessarily around one of the topics, although bravery is usually um, a difficult thing for people in organisations because they, they have the sort of, um, it's the phrase, learned helplessness. Again, I had no idea whether this is true, but it's one of those scientific studies that I was told once and it's stuck in my head around the where the term learned helplessness came from. It's something to do with sticking a bunch of uh, monkeys in a cage and, and giving them some bananas. And when they went to pick up the bananas, they shot them with a water cannon. And I, I presumably this was done a long time ago when animal rights wasn't a thing, right? <laughs> um, and so every time they put a banana and they went to get it, they, they hit them with the water cannon. So eventually they stopped ignoring, they started ignoring the, the bananas. And over time, they took monkeys out of the cage and put new ones in, so they were replacing them. And the new ones obviously didn't know about the water cannon, so when they went over to pick up the bananas, the rest of the monkeys hit them. So don't, ah, yeah, don't, don't do that, um, in however they speak. And then, um, but the, it kept going until a point where no monkey had ever seen the water cannon, but none of them would pick up a banana. And it's that that sense of learned helplessness. They, they just didn't know why they weren't doing it. They just weren't doing it. Um, mm -hmm. and, and in our organizations I see a lot of that there's no point us making this change because change doesn't happen well can you give me any example of well no that's just the way things are around here can't give you an example of it but I've been told so often that things don't change that there's no point hmm. that's that's a really interesting one um, because I was, I was going to ask you about uh, audacity that was mm. kind of the one that sticks out to me um, it's, it's a difficult one to me <laughs> <laughs> i know yeah i've since i've read your book i'm always blabbering on about audacity which I've, i would imagine would be quite annoying um <laughs> but uh yeah i know you mentioned before that you you maybe phrasing it as bravery might have been a bit more useful because uh but it wouldn't have you know it wouldn't have fitted into the squad acronym so exactly. maybe not but um but actually um well especially during these remote times uh, mm. right or trying to I guess we can't control how people behave, right? But we can guide them and we can we can at least show them what good looks like. But I'm finding audacity really difficult, like getting people to challenge the status quo uh, based on what you know what you were just saying, um, to challenge one another uh, even in a in a team full of people that barely know each other and they're all remote. Uh, it's it's a real challenge, and um, yeah, I just wanted to know if you'd had any feedback on audacity um, in general from other people yeah the i suppose the, there are two two techniques that people have picked out of this book more than anything else one of them i spelled out in a lot more detail than the other but one of them was the user manual which which people come out with quite a lot and i only really sort of paid not lip service to but i didn't really go into detail of it in the book uh, but the one where i did was the, where people have really latched onto is fear setting and that idea of just challenging your limiting beliefs challenging your assumptions about well what what do I think is going to happen here? If I'm, if I'm being brutal with myself here, what am I actually worried about? And let's put a plan together to reduce those worries, to, to recover the situation if it does happen, and actually to be a little bit more, um, have a different perspective on it as well. Um, so going through that process for a lot of people, whether it's you know speaking up in a, in a retrospective or challenging management or you know, whatever, just starting a new personal habit, whatever it is, that having that process for, okay, I'm going to assess my fears here rather than just have this undiagnosed, unlabeled, unanalyzed, just massive, which is, is, has been really helpful for people, I think. Yeah, it's definitely a part of the book that really struck with me the most because it's that kind of element that, uh, that people, I mean, loads of people talk about self-improvement, and delivery and unity but audacity is often one that's sort of overlooked in a way as a as a really you know big part of what makes uh you know a strong team so uh yeah it resonated with me i really i really enjoyed that part of the book I mean, it does take a lot of courage to to do something different to go against you know however many years of culture and you know, what you assume to be the case 
um, and to step up and take more responsibility. So there's got, first of all, I mean, there's got to be benefit to you to do that. There's got to be a, a, you know, an incentive, a personal incentive to do that. Uh, I mean, the good news is that most people, if, if everything was equal and they knew nothing bad would really happen, they would rather have greater control over themselves than be controlled. Um, so the, the philosophical uh, f fundamental is, is compelling, but there are too many buts associated with it um, for a lot of people. So, yeah, that being aware that, that that's that's there. And the other thing for me around audacity and courage and bravery, whatever you want to call it, is a lot of people unconsciously assume it to be binary. Either I am brave or I am not brave. You know, I am audacious or I am not. When actually there's different degrees of it and you don't have to start big. You can start small and it's a habit. It's it's you know, all these analogies of it's a muscle, the more you exercise it, but also the more you see other people do something and nothing really bad happens. If you're looking for it and you're actually you know, not filtering it out with your biases, you think, okay, yeah, all right. So that happened and all right, world didn't end. Maybe I could do something. You know, what's the smallest step you could take without those fears being paralyzing? And then reflecting on it and thinking, okay, maybe I could do a little bit more next time. So, working out where you are on that almost that continuum and, and taking as, as big a step as you're comfortable taking. Yeah. Cool. In the last um, book club, um, we were talking to Jeffrey Squirrel. Uh, sorry, Jeffrey Frederick and Douglas Squirrel. I just amalgamated their names there. <laughs> um, and uh, they were talking about sort of related, it's not the same technique by any means, but they were talking about like mining opportunities for conflict. So they're kind mm -hmm. of taking the sense of, of conflict and spinning it on its head and saying, actually, we should be inviting it and we should be building a culture where conflict in this particular way is seen as a positive because we are wanting the kind of dynamic that comes from really digging into our differences of opinion yeah. because that's where that spark of creativity is and that's where we can get to greatness rather than avoiding it um which i thought was really interesting and also like you say psychologically maybe quite terrifying for people at first mm. Um, but it's how do we build towards that place uh, so that we have a culture where people are more likely to do that. Yeah. Um, and I, I, yeah, I think you're right. It's it's gradual, right? It's kind of test the boundaries, be a little brave, do a little more, encourage other people. But um, I think that's such an interesting and tricky mindset, actually, to mine, to purposefully mine for conflict and to kind of have that almost as a working agreement that yeah. you want that yeah yeah we'll get one there. of the most one of the most powerful exercises or techniques that i've seen in this area but it is a risky one is is ritual descent i'm not sure whether you're familiar with with ritual descent so it's um it's a, a cognitive edge techniques so at dave snowden's company and um, and the idea and you can use it for all sorts of different things but um basically for idea critique so if you're looking to generate multiple ideas and you know, get some really quick feedback on them, um, if you've got a number of people, and ideally, ideally get a number of people together, break them up into groups and everybody come up with an idea in their teams. Once you've got a draft of that idea, whatever it be for a user story or a solution or a impediment removal or whatever, one person from that each table goes to another table and presents their idea to that group. Uh, and the rest of the group who they're who are there listening they, they don't do anything they don't talk they don't interrupt they just listen when the presentation has been finished and people have heard it the the idea presenter turns their back or if you're in a virtual world turns their camera off now you now you remember it now, Nicole yeah. uh, so, and and then the job of those people who've listened is to rip the idea to shreds is to say nothing positive at all about it okay They've got to come up with why it's the worst idea ever and why it will absolutely fail and backfire. And the person whose idea it has just has to stand there and listen. They can't rebut, they can't argue, they can't defend, they just have to listen. And then they can take that feedback back to their group and decide which of that feedback, if any, they want to incorporate into the next iteration of their idea. And then they go to a different group and do the same process. And the reason I bring that up is because it, if you know it's a game, if you know it's 
I can't say anything positive, then it's not personal or it's less likely to be personal. We may need, and I say it's risky because you may need some ground rules around respect or, or a little bit of trust in the room, but um, yeah, actually ripping it apart is actually something I encourage people to do with their own ideas. Um, you know, adopt the the, the uh, psychopath approach, put on the black hat of doom. How could this all go wrong? Um, and but if you're doing that with other people, then that's it's it builds trust so that once you actually are out of that mindset of I'm going to rip it apart, you can be a lot more in the middle and w actually real criticism, if you like, is a lot more tolerable. Right. I, I actually was thinking about this the other day because I was thinking about how do we proactively build psychological safety um, within teams. And I think, yeah, one of the, the kind of key things was frame it as an experiment, whether it's this ritual descent or whether it's something else. If, if it's within the bounds of an experiment, then it feels much safer for people to, to push and to, to give constructive criticism because, and to fail, because we know that experiments are based on hypotheses and that they fail even in science which is meant to be the subjective thing you know yeah. um so that i think that was my favorite my favorite answer when i was thinking about this recently in terms of how do we build psychological safety which is such a tough one in itself mm -hmm. <laughs> like we ask people that in interviews which is yeah. quite <laughs> what's the best answer you've got so far well that was one of them i really liked that that was actually my answer i think <laughs> um, <whatever it> <laughs> she also said encouraging a culture of um of feedback in general continuous yeah. feedback uh, and making that the norm um which obviously is a great one for building trust um yeah cool you're on mute david yeah actually on feedback i would say um I was re I've been uh, re-looking at your book over this weekend, and I quite like the, uh, the 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 what you pulled out about feedback, about actually feedback uh, about being you know when feedback is uh, not requested but 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 it but but is given, and that those sort of things or those mistakes around around feedback, the kind of the feedback sandwich, yeah, uh, and, and things like that. So uh, yeah, I I thought that was uh, yeah, it, it's it's. It's that idea of like when we give feedback, it has to be people are requesting it and and they're, and they're open to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, that was well, that was one of the things I was taught on my probably my first week in the job, um, my first job about the feedback sandwich. It was, it was that was that was a good way of giving feedback. People people told me. Yeah, yeah. Um, I still didn't feel right at the time. <laughs> <laughs> So, in, in terms of like the the uh, the like the milestone cards that you have at the, hmm. at the back of the book, is there is there any that you know this this there's, there's quite a lot of stuff there, and is there any that you kind of would 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 pull out as sort of the, these are the, the the sort of precursors to to making the sort of stepping stone from 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 good to great, or do they not work like that in your in your mind? I mean, I suppose that I think they probably could, um, but I don't think they would work like that if I picked them, if that makes sense. Um, so for me, I, I like teams to start from where they are. Um, so a really nice exercise is to go through those milestone cards and pick out a couple that they're really comfortable with already and say, do you know what? We're not starting from scratch. I reckon we've already got some of these in place. Um, and whether they, they start on building those because they're already confident in that area um, or using that, what's the next one that we think could uh, we could build on and, and almost you know, move to next. I think that is a really nice way of starting. We, we often assume that, and, and I, I mentioned this um, in the book itself, actually, when you start as a team, there are so many ways that you can get better. It can almost be a bit overwhelming and think, well, where do we start? And, Actually, geez, we've got so far away from where we want to be. But then choosing to view that as, well, if you've got all these opportunities to improve, then brilliant, just pick any of them. Yeah? Um, and that get into a habit of, of getting better. But the cards, I, I like to 
the ones that I've seen working with teams where you know, they've got these ones, that think, right? Yeah, we, we like these. We're doing okay with these. We'll check in now and again to make sure we haven't you know, slacked on some of them. But where, which one would we like to focus on next? Which one do we think would be really useful to us where we are as a team? And then consciously, proactively working towards it. It's kind of, um, it's, well, partly inspired, like I said in the book, by the, the our new baby, but also from, um, I've just lost it. I lose my tread, uh, thread now and again. But yeah, this idea of um, working towards something can be a little bit intimidating if you think it's, you know, it's normal. So the cards we've got um, for a baby, for example, you know, they're not time bound on when they should be crawling or anything like that because every team develops at a different rate, just like a baby develops at a different rate. So it's not about putting a judgment on a team saying, you know, you should be here. Um, by this time uh, you, know, you you are where you are and, and you're developing when you're developing and you're meeting different challenges uh, that's that's interesting what you say there in terms of like engage it how do you find that you you sort of engage teams to start making this this, this journey from, from from good to great you know because there is a, a lot there I and mean, what, what what sort of the the natural approach because that that's sort of been my sort of question when i've been reading the book there's so much stuff here how, how do I, how do how do I, and also about the change about the amount of change you know that am i am i, am I trying to push change or uh, in trying to do this how how do i do this where i'm not pushing change to people part part of um the idea behind these milestones is is it's kind of to try and make the journey to greatness a little bit more enjoyable rather than just enjoying it when you get there because it is going to be a long journey and you know rewarding yourself along the way and having a bit of fun and you know certifying things as we're going i think it's quite important from a motivation point of view but also you know, you're going to spend most of your time getting there so why not enjoy the process of getting there rather than just being there at the end um so where do i start well i start really with trying to get some permission and trying to tap into their intrinsic motivation you know so it would be a i know some of the teams that I've seen, but every team's different. So what, what are some of the great teams that you've been part of? Tell me what, what was great about them uh, and try and create, get that team to create their own sense of greatness that they can, you know, come to agreement on because there'll be edge cases that aren't relevant for some members of the team. Maybe someone's talking about a sports team and someone's talking about a software team. Someone's talking about being part of a, um, a working in a, in a hotel or something. And it's, there are, there are commonalities and there are overlaps, but there are things that aren't that they're, domain specific so try and find the core threads that they can agree on and then then ask them what would what would it be to them to get to that state here in this team would how beneficial would that be for you what would it give you um almost you know effectively doing a bit of a cost benefit analysis is that is the process of change worth it is it something you want to go towards and if the answer is yes because you don't they don't have to as, as Ed said, you can stay as a, as a good team. That's fine. It's probably better than most of the teams you're going with. But if you had the opportunity, do, would you want that? Okay. And if the answer is yes, then would you like my help? Uh, and then we agree on how what that help's going to be. It's not going to be telling them. It's not going to be holding. You know, I'm not holding them to account. They're going to be holding themselves to account. All that kind of stuff. Um, and so, well, so where do you want to start next? This is a list that maybe something jumps out, but equally, you might already have something that's forefront of your mind. This would be a great place to start. So I, I try and meet the team where they are. I want to get their permission for themselves, but also my permission. Um, and then give them something that they can work with if they want to, but in the knowledge that it's their agenda, not mine. Mm -hmm. So I have to be open to the fact that they'll say no. So that's the tricky thing when you are a coach, right? Um, if people are struggling with items that you feel from your experience could be super helpful. Like in the, I was just looking at the cards again and you've got reference on there to things like process and the system. 
And some of these words can feel quite dry and mm -hmm. alienating. And I know you're trying to alleviate that through the cards, right? But um, that's where I've come unstuck sometimes, um, is that there's uh, this um, resistance or this difficulty getting over that hurdle of how to think about the system and how to think about the process, particularly in terms of how to measure it and how to really understand some of those metrics that can look really scary and can seem really dry. Um, and that's where often I found myself having to do lots and lots of work. And then, you know, sometimes you may not succeed. Um, so, I was, I, yeah, I guess in a, in a roundabout way, I'm saying, how do you deal with some of the, that where it can seem it can seem a bit dry and overwhelming when you're talking about system process and metrics. So by the sounds of it, the fact that you said sometimes it doesn't work would imply to me that sometimes it does. <laughs> sure, sure. So in your experience, when has it worked and what have you done to help it? What work? you're doing there, Jeff. I see you. You're coaching me now. Yeah. <laughs> um... Well, I, I think you're right. It's about putting the empowerment back in their hands. So I've asked them how they would want to, how, how can they tell mm -hmm. if we're going to run this experiment, uh, so I framed it as an experiment, how will they know that it's been successful and how will they know that potentially it hasn't and they want to drop it and try something mm -hmm. else? Um, so that's helped, um, but I still have found then kind of looking at some of those metrics you know with our um, scatterplot diagram and things that still we can have had a really positive start into yes we do want to improve and we've agreed these are the things that we think are important to track and now i'm looking at the scatterplot diagram and oh i've kind of lost the thread of why we were here you know okay. so what is what was the thread Sorry, what oh, the thread of why we yeah. You lost the thread. You had it at some point. When you mm -hmm. had it, what was it? Um, so I think the general gist here for me is why why are they doing it? Not not how are they doing it, but why are they doing it? Right. And what does the system, what does process, what does metrics mean and do for them? So why would they want to improve the system? Tell me, tell me a story of when the system screwed you over. Mm. All right. You did your bit, but it didn't work out. All right. What, so why is it in your interest to change the system? That, these kinds of questions. Tell me a story of how the system can work for you rather than against you. Okay. What would you need to do to get closer to that? And who do you need to bring into the conversation to make it more likely to happen? bringing it back to the personal, bringing it back to what's in it for them. Why should they, you know? Um, and again, it's kind of story based because they can tell me a story of when the system screwed them over. Yeah. 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 And then by doing that, we ta we're tapping into their emotions. We're tapping into their drivers. We're tapping into things like frustration. And then we can start rewriting that story to how would that have felt or what, how would that, have, what would that have look like if the system had been working for you? Where's the gap? So what's it, how, how much value is there to you in changing this? Mm, I actually, David was, has been talking about this quite a lot recently. So sometimes we get lost in our own sort of coachy world where we're so used to some of these concepts and some of the jargon and we forget to kind of put ourselves in the shoes of that individual within the team um, in so many different ways in terms of their like personality type and their role. So I know David had a lot of success kind of putting himself in a developer's shoes in that way recently. And it can be easy to forget to do, even though it's, it seems obvious in a way. Mm -hmm. it's, it's almost like taking it down to, to, to forgetting who we are and thinking more about what, 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 the, what the people want that you're, you're, you're working with. I think, Jeff, uh, in your, you know, the video that we made, made reference to before, the remote one, mm -hmm. I think you're... You're, when you were talking, I, I'm not a big cricket fan, but when you were talking about uh, cricket coaching and you were talking about that bit, and I think it's towards the end of the video, uh, I, I found that really powerful. Actually, you know, it really, it actually really put a lot of what you talked about in the book 
in context for me, which mm. is like, like, what do you want to get good at? But people, you know, like you say, that, that question, that it's a really great question. It's like, what do you see as being great? Let, let, let's, let's start from there and maybe not bring you your own preconceptions, which I, I know I've done in the past. It's like, well, I see a great team as doing X, X, X Y, and Z, but, but and people within the team may have, have a completely different different view of that and they they come from a different perspective they're they're not thinking it as an agile coach they're thinking it as a as a developer and how they want to take forward their career or how what stresses they have on them so, mm-hmm. uh, yeah i thought i thought that was really good that what, what you talked about about cricket coaching uh, right. it, in many ways it's a scary concept yeah, if you talk to a parent about it they say but what how does my 10 year old know what to get better you're the coach you're the expert you've played the game you know what so to teach them teach them so i could but to be taught you need to be receptive uh, and what's better way of being receptive than to ask to be taught something rather than to be told what they're going to be taught now the the rhetorical question that i would generally ask back is can you imagine anything that your 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 child would ask for to get better at, at a cricket training session that would be bad for their development no so it doesn't matter what they want to get better at. They're going to get better. Um, and the multiplication factor there of not only the fact that they're more receptive to the thing they want to get better at, but they're now also th- proactively in the habit of thinking, what do I want to get better at? And how can I get someone to help me get better at it? It's much more powerful than turning up and thinking, what's someone going to tell me to do this week? Mimi, you've got to give your examples. You got to. <laughs> <laughs> hi <laughs> hi no i'm nodding like profusely like, i'm nodding like crazy because i totally agree i used to be a nanny so i totally understand the whole idea of um encouraging children to take command of their own learning and allowing them to kind of learn on their own or be in charge of that because they the buy you don't need you don't need to figure out how to get buy in. They're already bought in if they're trying to figure it out if they ask questions about certain things or if you can give them tools to kind of figure things out on their own. Then when they come to you, then you know okay they definitely need my help. But the more you kind of give them tools to figure things out on their own, the more that they eventually learn. I have a brother and I've I've given him free reign of YouTube and he's messed up my settings because now all I see is everything to do with um space craft and space and this rocket and there's this game that he he doesn't play it he just watches how people play it but it's building spaceships he tells me about the different parts I have no idea what he's talking about but he's taken his own learning to a completely different level he's only nine but some of the things he can talk about he can probably have a conversation with some kind of rocket scientist. You can tell I don't know anything because of the terminology I'm using, but he can have a conversation. It's so I'm just, I was just resonating with what you were saying about, you know, giving a child, allowing a child to ask for what it is that they want to learn and the fact that they will, the, the, you know, the whole idea of buying and things like that. But exactly, push versus pull. Yeah. Um, but then it's, I think, Again, like, I sometimes forget that adults, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, sometimes you you wonder if adults will figure it out on their own. And I'm just like, well, they're adults. So of course they'll figure it out on their own. But it's like, it's finding that balance of giving them tools that they can figure the things out and not allow, I don't know how to explain it. Do you get what I'm trying to say? I think so. I mean, we, we, it's amazing how ingrained this, this culture of being waiting to be told what needs to be done is. Yeah. And seeing that between the difference between a parent and a child is, is quite illuminating because children haven't got that drilled into them yet. And so the natural curiosity and the natural, they just want to be independent. Yeah. Um, it's sort of part of our natural development as, as a human being. We need to develop independence. Um, so we're facilitating it. But we can have this learned dependence as well as learned helplessness within the organisation. Um, so what helps, I think, is 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 nothing that's particularly um, 
groundbreaking here, but as well as having the tools to be able to do something, having a purpose, you know, something, a reason to self-organize, a reason to take autonomy um, and a valid assessment of the safety to do so. Um, because we do assume that something, if something goes wrong, there's going to be, and I, I was guilty of this when I first started doing Scrum, I was of the opinion that we were going to be, back, this is like 20 years ago, that we would just wait until the end of the sprint and vote off the weakest link. Genuinely thought that, you know, we were going to hold up cards. Yes, Steph's the person we're voting off this week. Um, I, I, was, I was really worried that was going to happen, right? Because there was such transparency. So that sense of that's just the culture that was sort of bred into us, if you like. So, yeah, it takes quite a while. But the, for me, what I'm seeing is certainly over the last 20 years, I'm seeing a shift leadership level wise in terms of appreciation that culturally the, the domain that we're in as an organization, we can't we can't rely on expert leadership. We need collaborative leadership. We need engaged leadership. Um, so it's been slow, a lot slower than I would have liked. But changing human habits is slow and when they're reinforced by money and culture and family and all these different things it's very difficult to, to do any quicker than than you can so you just got to be patient uh, and uh, keep work keep working on the kids the kids of the future <laughs> yeah, so don't don't get them to a point where we have to get them to unlearn what they've been taught because unlearning stuff as human beings is quite painful i was gonna ask actually about the whole idea of culture um we're quite lucky that we have a very very open culture in 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 um this organization but there are some places where you go and it comes from the top that kind of closeness or the command and control style of of working so sometimes you find that even if a team a specific team is doing great things they're deemed to be lazy or not doing enough work or having too much fun or something like that. What advice would you give to those teams to kind of encourage them to keep doing what they're doing and hopefully kind of let their what they're doing shine shine as a beacon for others to follow rather than maybe thinking it's actually easier to just conform to the current culture and stop what they're doing? Yeah. Um, for, before I answer your actual question, I've just got um, a little bit of advice for you if you want it. Yes, please. <laughs> you said you were lucky to have a culture of openness. Mm -hmm. It's not luck. That's been created. Definitely. It's been, it's been nurtured. It's been maintained. Um, and using the word lucky, although it was in, in no way intended this way, is a little bit disrespectful to the people that have put the effort in to create that openness. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of leading me on to my answer to your actual question, which is that those teams that are doing that stuff, the, the good stuff, but are being met with the responses that aren't necessarily reinforcing that commitment, mm -hmm. um, is to have a little bit of empathy. Because it's very easy to say, you know, we're doing all this stuff and they're not doing their bit and they keep asking us to do it. It's natural and it's actually on the face of it exactly what's happening. However, those people that are responding that way still, I would be willing to bet, want that organization to be successful. I'm pretty sure those people don't want to demotivate or disempower or sabotage those teams. But there's something going on that's making the behavior that they're demonstrating a no brainer for them. So they are facing some difficult challenges, whatever they are, we don't know what they are because we're focusing on our own stuff, but they've got other challenges, other conflicts, other demands, pressures. And if the team can empathize with that and say, all right, I, I, you must be in a really difficult position here. How can what we're doing help you? So you use the phrase, you know, be it shine a light for others to follow. But I think there's something else there around shining a light for others to share that light, if you like. Um, because, you know, one of my favorite quotes is, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you don't care who gets the credit. And if you can let other people take the glory, take the credit, then you're more likely to get the result you want. 
And if it means a senior leader getting the credit for doing something agile or getting the credit for you know your your team's success and change, so be it. There's a bigger game at play here. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. No worries. <laughs> Aurelia, did you want to say something? You used the little symbol. Hi. Um, yes, uh, I, I, I had this. It was a bit of an impulsive question because you, um, you know, when you asked the question, Nicole, Jeff sort of turned it around and started asking all these coaching questions, but like, but really good ones, really good ones. And uh, not like, how to say, I kind of, it's, it's a bit of a vague question, like on learning to ask the right questions where the person doesn't, you know, feel interrogated or you don't. Yeah, essentially, how how did you learn? I, I assume it's, it's some of the experience, but maybe, yeah, just how, how to learn to ask to ask the right questions um, and, and on the spot. Uh, how do we, how do we the learn to do Well, through doing, right? Not just doing, right? mindful doing and reflection okay so i have a i have a hypothesis i have a i have a feeling i have a intuition call it what you like that this question would be useful many different ways that i could phrase it i've got to try something and then not only do i ask the question but i'm also asking for feedback on how useful that question was how did it make you feel? Did it make you feel defensive? Did it make you feel curious? How did it make you feel? So I can do that actually as I'm going, or not just or, and I could do that as an actual practice. So one of the things that that I do myself and do with other coaches is, is hot seat questioning. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really simple technique. It feels a bit weird, but it, it is basically to practice one particular skill, which is asking good questions. And what was so, the technique? Sorry, I, I didn't catch I call that. It hot seat questioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so practically how it works is you know, in a small group, say six people, one person just talks for about 60 seconds on something that you know they're, they're struggling with, they want some progress, they make some progress on. And the other five people are listening. And then when that person's finished, they get to ask one question each. Just one question. And they ask it knowing that they won't get an answer to it. So I would ask you my question and it wouldn't be, I, I don't want you to answer my question. I want you to tell me how useful the question was to you. Okay. Now, knowing that I'm not going to get an answer frees me up a little bit because I'm not indulging my curiosity anymore. It has to be useful to you, not me. And that's the first step is try and take your curiosity out of the equation. Um, and And it's not that... Any, there, it's not that some questions are amazing and some questions aren't. It's um, it's that some are useful in certain circumstances with certain people, and it's about building up that that almost database, if you like, because that's all an intuition is. It's just a set of data points collected over a number of years that is you, know, you can't really draw the, the a, a, a precise pattern from, but you you kind of know through experience. So that's just practice and get feedback. It's the short answer. Thanks. But uh, yeah, the specific technique and yeah, thanks. It was really helpful. Okay. Um, we're, uh, we're, we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but Jeff, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking time to come along and talk to us today. It's been, I, from my perspective, I think for everybody else, it's been uh, really useful and uh, really enlightening. Yeah, so, you're welcome. Thank, thank you, you ever so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, people. Bye. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you. Cheers, guys.